I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. It is the Sony a7S III. This is a camera, yes, but it's not just any camera. This camera is amazing. Let me tell you why. Firstly, it has the most incredible autofocus system, which means that you can get any take that you want to get in one or two shots. Pretty cool, saves you time. But also, inside here is the most enormous sensor. But this is not a 64 megapixel sensor. This is only a 12 megapixel sensor. What does that mean? It means the photo sites are enormous. That means they suck in lots of light, and that means it can pretty much see in the dark. But it's not the most amazing thing about this camera. Oh no. See, this camera has built into it, somewhere in all that electronic wizardry, a time machine. It can see back in time. And what you realize is that when you hit record, what actually was going on was that you were recording not from over there, but from over here. And that means this and this are how we do this. But that's the thing, isn't it? You see, most things that look magical have an explanation. And once you know how the trick is done, well then everything falls into place. In last week's episode, we ventured into the dark forest where nothing at all was what it seemed and unimaginable horrors lurked around every corner. Well, this week we're laboring the fantasy metaphor yet further with a languid lunge through illusion, magic, and scarcely credible financial finagling in what critics are already calling the David Blaine of crypto films. Top financial YouTuber Andre Jick is a former illusionist turned millionaire boaster who loves to delight his audience with sleight of hand before unleashing his brand of financial entertainment. But nowhere on Andre's tube has he ever mentioned DeFi, although we do find Doge there. And I think that's a shame because, as we're going to show in tonight's very special webgram, if there is indeed magic in finance, it's to be found nestling in the quivering bosom of DeFi. You'll gaze in wonder at the sequined undergarments of Anchor. Gasp as we jump forward in time with Alchemix and hold our beating hearts in our mouths at the high wire tightrope balancing act of Gyroscope. All of that to come on this week's episode of The Defiant. You were supposed to make me disappear. There you go. Before we go any further, just a quick word about our sponsor, Balancer, who are up to some pretty funky stuff to help ease the pain of high gas costs on Ethereum. Trade as much as you like and recoup most of the gas costs? Damn straight. And in their new Bal for Gas campaign, traders are receiving six figures worth of Bal tokens every week. And with version two just around the corner, Balancer is becoming a one-stop shop for DeFi liquidity. Version 2 is going to be bringing stable pools and weighted pools tightly integrated under a single protocol with flash loans, lending via asset managers, and much, much more. Check it out at balancer.finance. I'm very proud to announce we also have Arva as a sponsor of the channel. Fun fact, the name Arva is taken from the Finnish word for ghost, and it's a decentralized, open source, and non-custodial liquidity protocol on Ethereum. Depositors earn interest by providing liquidity to lending pools, while borrowers can obtain loans by tapping into these pools with variable and stable interest rate options. Deposit in Arva protocol and receive A tokens, which accrue interest every second right in your wallet. Seriously, you can watch your balance go up every second. Swap any of your deposited assets at any time to get the best yields on the market. For the developers out there, Arva features access to DeFi building blocks like flash loans and credit delegation. Arva protocol liquidity pools are now available in Ethereum and the sidechain Polygon. Good stuff. Now, back to the film. One of the best films about magic in recent years was Chris Nolan's The Prestige. There's a famous old man explains world rules moment in the film where Michael Caine details the three parts of a great magic trick. The first part is the pledge. Show something ordinary like a deck of cards or a stable coin that make you do something extraordinary, like disappear or earn 300% APY. That's the turn. But as Michael explains, You're looking for the secret, but you won't find it. Because of course, you're not really looking. You don't really want to know. Want to be fooled. But you wouldn't clap yet. 
Because making something disappear isn't enough. You have to bring it back. Bringing it back. That's the prestige, the cherry on the cake, the real magic. And it wasn't so long ago that a decentralized stablecoin was enough to be the prestige. But then we had yield farming, flash loans, and multi-layer composability. And in this episode, I've picked three projects that perform what looks like a very new kind of prestige. And of course, it won't feel like that for long, but let's start by identifying that prestige element, and then let's see if we can figure out how the trick is done. I make no apology. The Terra DeFi ecosystem with UST, Mirror, Luna, and Anchor has really taken me by surprise this year. We did a tutorial a few weeks back showing how to get a 20% fixed interest rate on UST deposits. And I guess it shouldn't have been a surprise that many were skeptical about the sustainability of that rate, given that, well, it's so high. Now, we're accustomed to absurd APYs while farming, but we also fully understand these are temporary, and the whole thing can crash at a moment's notice. That's part of the game. But a sustained fixed rate of interest, principle protected, and that's a whole different ballgame. And many weren't convinced by A, its sustainability, or B, the mechanism by which they're able to deliver it. So let's try and break it down and see what's really going on here, because it can feel a little bit complicated. So build as the stripe for savings, Anchor is the first interchain DeFi application that pulls the emission from proof of stake blockchains, stabilizes it, and passes it on as fixed high yield interest to depositors. Their goal is to establish a gold standard for fixed interest rates in DeFi. In other words, prove that it can be done and set the standard by which all others must be measured, which is some flex when you consider just how low legacy banking interest rates are these days. At its core, Anchor is a money market with two sides, depositors saving in UST and borrowers who provide collateral in the form of cash flow assets. It's the cash flow from these assets that's used to pay the interest rates of the depositors. And at present, the only collateral available to borrowers is B Luna, which is minted from Luna through a process called bonding. Luna is a cash flow asset that earns stablecoin fees from real world usage of the Chai payments app. More on that in a bit, but this isn't some rinky-dink 100-user crypto dApp, not at all. And in the future, Anchor will be adding more staking tokens such as ETH2, Cosmos, Polkadot, Solana, and so on and so on to be used as collaterals. Because the issuance rates of these blockchains are well known, the yield from staking can be modeled to arrive at the 20% return. So what we're looking at here are liquid staking derivatives. The returns from these are then paid to depositors. But I know what you're thinking. Even in the quiet times, these underlying assets are highly volatile. Well, this is where it gets spicy. Firstly, Anchor isn't just taking borrowers' collateral. Lenders are also depositing UST, which Anchor can then use to acquire more yield-generating staking assets. But beyond that, borrowers have to seriously over-collateralize, providing double what they want to borrow. Now, every epoch, rewards of deposited B asset collaterals are collected by the money market. Claimed B asset rewards, which are likely to be in a non stable coin denomination, are converted to Terra stable coins and stockpiled separately in the market's yield reserve pool. Still with me? But what if there are more savers than borrowers? How can this possibly be sustainable? Does Anchor have sufficient cash flows from the pooled collateral to pay their depositors? Well, let's dig in. Now, Anchor uses a mechanism called the utilization ratio, which is the ratio of borrowers to savers. Now, a low number means that there are more savers than borrowers, and a high number means there are more borrowers than savers. When the utilization ratio is high, the borrowing rate increases, and this should lower the leverage and restore market liquidity by encouraging repayments. And of course, when the utilization ratio is low, i.e. there are more savers than borrowers, the borrowing rate falls to incentivize more lending and collaterals to pay savers. Now, the borrow rate is currently set at 34%, which, yes, seems pretty high, particularly when you think borrowers have to provide double collateral in the first place. So doesn't it really look like borrowers are getting a pretty poor deal comparatively? Well, there is another piece to this puzzle, the ANC token. Now, the ANC token is Anchor Protocol's governance token, and these tokens can be used to vote on proposals, but they can also do a bunch more, with ANC designed to capture a portion of Anchor's yield through protocol fees. Now, these fees come from three different sources. B Asset Rewards, 
excess yield and collateral liquidation fees. A portion of rewards from deposited B asset collaterals are used to purchase ANC with the remainder used to replenish the yield reserve. Deposit yields in excess of the target deposit rate is accumulated to the yield reserve with a portion used to purchase ANC. Purchased ANC tokens are then redistributed to ANC stakers. And finally, whenever a loan is liquidated, 1% of the liquidated collateral value is sent to the yield reserve, of which a portion of which is used to purchase ANC. What a bird's nest of crazy stuff going on. When it's all very nice, but how does this apply to borrowers? Well, if you borrow against collateral on Anchor, the protocol will distribute ANC tokens to you every block proportional to the amount you borrowed. And let me show you just how wild this is. All right, so this is how it works. We go to anchorprotocol.com, go to the web app, and we're confronted with the web dashboard. And it's still saying 20%. When we last looked at this, it was above 20%. I think it was around 21.3, I think. And it is being held rock solid at 20% APY, which is just remarkable. So if we now go to the borrow tab, this is where it gets really exciting. So down the bottom, you can see uh, the B Luna, um, and that's where you provide your collateral for a loan. Now up here, we look in the net APR. Down here, the borrow APR is 34.79% today. And the distribution APR is 104%. What does that mean? Well, up here it tells you in the net APR. So it says the distribution APR for borrow APR. When the net APR is a positive number, ANC rewards distributed to borrowers are greater than the interest to be paid for the loan. What does this mean? It basically means that it's more profitable for you to borrow money on Anchor than to lend it. On the earn side, we have 20%. On the borrow side, we have 69.21%. Now bear in mind, this is 69.21% profit gain. If this number was red, it would mean you'd be losing money to borrow. So you will be incentivized to lend. But at the moment, the borrowers are being so heavily incentivized to borrow that it's worth more to do that on the protocol than to lend, which is insane. I have a real problem with this because a few years ago, I got myself completely out of debt. No more, no more debts. I hate the idea of loans. I hate the idea of like owing money to anybody. And yet here is a situation where objectively speaking, it makes a lot more sense for me to take that borrowing option, get rewarded in ANC tokens, which are a yield bearing token anyway, which I can then stake or I can put into farming. It takes a lot of mental gymnastics to get your head around to the fact that borrowing is more profitable than lending. But here's the proof. And that is why this is so wild. So this is not me giving you financial advice and saying go borrow on Anchor. But if you are prepared to play the other side of the market, then it could be pretty, pretty sweet. Anchor, it's wild. Right now, the only asset you can bond as collateral is Luna, which is the native asset of the Terra blockchain. But what's interesting is that the chain's staking rewards are funded by transaction fees incurred by payment apps running on the Terra blockchain, like Chai, as I mentioned earlier. Now, it's pretty easy to be skeptical about payment apps because, well, how many have we seen over the last few years? But I did some digging into some numbers for Chai, which you can find on chaiscan.com. So the place to look for this information is Chai Scan. And if you look at the daily payments, it's 2,209,385,812 uh, Korean won. And if we look at that in dollars, that is a little under 2 million, which doesn't sound that exciting, does it? But what's really interesting here is the number of daily active users, 60,589. Total users, 2.3 million, but it's the daily active users that's the interesting one. There's a bunch of other data on here, which you can look at to your heart's content. We'll leave a link in the description below. But let's just for comparison, have a look at Uniswap. How many individual daily active users do you think there are on Uniswap? So not the easiest information to find, but there is a, a tab on uh, Dune Analytics from Lottie. Thank you, Lottie. And if we look here, um, well, let's have a look. At the beginning of the month, we were looking at 51,764 today. Uh, we're looking at, let's see, it's nudging 40,000. 
So fewer daily active users on Uniswap than on ChaiScan. And bear in mind that Uniswap covers the entire world. ChaiScan at the moment is only South Korea. Of course, there is a big number which we haven't talked about, which is the volume. So the volume on Uniswap today, 1.25 billion. And that is where Uniswap is so, so impressive. The volume per user is absolutely astronomical. And that is something that Chai cannot compete with. However, the point is, Chai is a payments app. You wouldn't expect people to be spending hundreds of thousands, 200,000 uh, dollars worth of, or Korean won worth of payments. It's small payments. So those active users, it's quite impressive. And if you scale that up to the rest of the world, something quite interesting could happen. The only thing that I worry is, if I were to tell my friends, for instance, shh, if I were to tell my friends, for instance, that this was a Korean payment app, if I were to mention Korea at all, would they be interested or would there be some kind of Western snobbery attached to that? I think it's a fair question. So I'm curious whether we can get past that and look at simply the product itself, the fact that it's global and permissionless, to get to a place where we can use these without worrying about where it came from. I'm not sure if we're there yet. So yes, there is obviously an elephant in the room here, which is that nearly every single asset connected to this system is inherently volatile. And while the market is buoyant, well, that's fine. But we all know that bear markets are real and horrifying and last much longer than we would ever hope. Now, ANC might not be so appealing if the token isn't doing that well and isn't worth very much. But the yield reserve mechanism does appear to be designed specifically to plan for this by retaining a good percentage in Terra's native stablecoin UST. That 20% interest rate is indeed an anchor, but could it also be an albatross? And is it possible to lower the interest rate if times get tough? Well, yes, the interest rate can be voted on by ANC token holders, but given that it's the founding philosophy of the entire protocol, it would probably be an absolute measure of last resort. But yes, that option is there. Now, one thing I'm aware of when getting stuck into Terra, Mirror, and Anchor is that this isn't really ready for the man or woman on the street yet. It's taken me several days of reading and rereading to properly figure out. But there is a new consumer-friendly app called Cash coming soon that will leverage all the different components of this system, but in a nice, simple UX. And I am personally looking very much forward to trying it out. How about a magic trick? Now, as clever as Anchor is, there is no escaping the fact that at some point, if you are borrowing on the protocol, you are going to have to pay it back. But what if you didn't? That brings us to our next seemingly magical protocol, Alchemix, the future yield tokenization protocol. On their website, they say they are rewriting the laws of finance. So what does the prestige look like here? Investors use interest and dividends as a source of income. However, these payments are usually quarterly at best. But Alchemix is a newer DeFi protocol that flips this concept on its head by providing the ability to get your future yield now. Alchemix vaults act as the hub to generate yield advances in the form of a synthetic derivative called AlUSD, which is pegged to $1. Launched in February, Alchemix has reached an impressive $1.21 billion in total value locked. Deposit DAI, and you can borrow up to 50% of the deposited amount of that DAI at a one-to-one -one ratio by minting all USD. The deposited DAI is then deployed to Yearn Vaults to earn yield and continuously pay back the vault owner's debt, while the vault owner themselves can choose to use the all USD for personal expenses, farming, or buying a Porsche, like your boy, Sobi. All you care about is money. Vaults themselves are not liquidatable by keepers based on a collateralization ratio like with Maker, Ava, Compound, or Reflexer. The owner of an Alchemix vault can choose to liquidate part of their collateral to repay the loan, allowing them to withdraw whatever is remaining. But there is no liquidation to enforce maintaining a specific loan to collateral ratio. What does that mean? Well, this is a loan that repays itself. Your only debt is time. The loan simply disappears. It's gone. It's gone. Typically, if you hold die, you would probably put it in somewhere like Compound, Ave, or Yearn, so you could earn some interest over the course of the year. So maybe if you put $100 in, by the end of the year, you might have 110, 120 if you're lucky. With Alchemix, you put it in our system and it's in Yearn, so it's earning yield this entire time, with one additional benefit is that you can now mint 
a synthetic stablecoin that's pegged to a dollar. So this will allow you to expand your capital base to go long on a different asset, to finance things in your personal life, or to buy a boat. So in the short term for Alchemix, we're going to be getting audited by Certic, and that report will be out uh, early May. Then we're going to work on more integrations in DeFi while we are also building out version 2 of Alchemix along with Alchemix DAO. Version 2 of Alchemix will allow for any viable stablecoin with a vault to be added as collateral. So USDC, USDT, or SUSD, for instance. And there will be new all assets such as all ETH and all BTC2. Now look, I didn't get Alchemix at first. Sure, the sales pitch is cool, but I really just don't like the idea of loans and debt. But the more I thought about it, I started to think how we could use it to fund creative projects, for instance, where the capital invested would reset upon completion of the loan period and then become available to reuse for another project. In other words, no sunk cost, a funding flywheel where fear of failure disappears completely. And I can do something with that, and maybe I will. And if you want to get an idea of how Alchemix works, DeFi Dad did a great tutorial this week, which you can find on the site at thedefiant.io. Thanks, DeFi Dad. If you're good at something, never do it for free. And we end this film by taking a look at a new algorithmic stablecoin that has my head spinning like a gyroscope. And in the wake of what happened with Faye, you're probably thinking that we just need to kind of chill out on stablecoin experiments. But here we are with Gyroscope, a seemingly impossible collection of game theory trade-offs with huge promises that makes you feel kind of... Hey, 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 look at me. So what is the prestige here? Well, it's this. How do you create a decentralized stablecoin that works in all weathers, stratifies all risk, promotes sound governance, and can last for decades. It's not possible. No, it's necessary. So what is it? Ah, uh, okay, well, it is, it's pretty complicated, but let me try and explain. The gyroscope protocol is an all-weather stablecoin designed to be the last word in decentralized stability. And there are three main pillars keeping it all together. One, it's designed to be all-weather, backed by a reserve that stratifies all DeFi risks, including centralization, regulatory ones, governance, and composability risks, not just price risk. That's a lot of risk. Secondly, they've designed a brand new type of automated market maker system to boost liquidity. It's an S-A-M-M, P-A-M-M combination, which frankly, I don't understand at all. Thirdly, they've completely rewritten the rules on how we govern in a decentralized system with conditional cash flows and optimistic approval. <sighs> Fundamentally, it's designed to build a virtuous cycle between the different users gyro dollar holders, governors, and yield farmers so that the whole gyroscope just keeps spinning. If it wasn't clear already, this is way, 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 way above my pay grade. I mean, I went through all the documentation, I read everything that they'd written, and, 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 yeah. All of this is one little girl's bedroom every moment. It's infinitely complex. They have access to infinite time and space, but they're not bound by anything. Now, the other thing is, it doesn't help that when I look at the gyroscope logo, I see this, a giant black hole sucking everything in from which nothing can escape. Sound familiar? I hold my hands up, my brain surrenders. The only thing I can really do here is talk to the team behind gyro itself and see if they could answer any of my simpleton questions. The core value propositions of DeFi are that it offers a finance which is non-custodial, permissionless, openly auditable, and composable. While USDC and DAI are clearly of great value to the community, and we'll be including them in Gyroscope itself, commitment to these original propositions means that they can't be where the innovation just stops. DAI is great, which is why we want to include it, but it has a few issues. So one is that the scalability relies on the leveraged long ETH market scaling, and this has run into issues and it likely will do so again. Also, the pure DAI design also faces deleveraging risks, as we saw on Black Thursday. Maker responded by essentially tethering DAI to USDC to mitigate this risk, uh, but this is at the expense of a now deep reliance on USDC. Every non-custodial stablecoin should worry about being all weather, and should have a vision in place for what happens if and when problems arise with USDC. That's where we see gyro fitting in. The main idea of gyroscope is that its robustness relies on a number of layers or yeah, lines of defense. 
uh, each of which is relatively simple on its own terms. The, the first line of defense is the all weather portfolio. So by carefully selecting a structured portfolio of assets to back the stablecoin rather than just a single asset, in the event of a catastrophic failure of individual components of the portfolio, gyroscope should be better able to weather a storm. But if other systems do break, which would entail shocks that are catastrophic to other stablecoins, we have further lines of defense. The second line of defense centers on how we price gyro around the $1 mark in the event of shocks that would break other systems and that lead to gyro becoming under-reserved. It's fairly easy to handle above peg prices. Gyroscope expands supply and the proceeds strengthen the reserve. The difficulty, of course, is what happens if gyro dollars deviates below peg when it's under-reserved. So in, in this event, gyro programs a stablecoin redemption curve that starts near a dollar, so, so bear with me. So the redemption curve aims to foster good liquidity around the peg, but with a built-in circuit breaker, which stops heavy outflows from capsizing the reserve. At this circuit breaker, the redemption rate decreases below the actual reserve ratio, at which redemptions are always sustainable. In my mind, the most beautiful part of the design would have to be the primary market AMM and secondary market AMM combination. We call these the PAM and the SAM because it's a bit of a mouthful. Roughly, the idea is that the PAM quotes mint and redeem prices, providing a pricing band for the SAM, and then the SAM concentrates liquidity within these bands. Users are always able to mint and redeem using PAM quotes. We then optimize the SAM pricing rule to the task of providing liquidity within this band. In combining these AMMs, we are able to design the system to guarantee great liquidity everywhere, but especially around the peg in the SAM. With our design in Gyroscope, all of every $1 that's paid for a new stablecoin actually goes into our reserve. So this is in contrast to the algorithmic stablecoins everyone's upset about these days, where either all or part of this dollar goes into the pockets of the protocol stakeholders. A reserve is something that stores value, um, and the protocol can use this value to either balance the stablecoin or back the value of the stablecoin. Uh, most existing stablecoins that use a reserve today hold these reserves in a single asset like USDC. So Maker, through its peg stability module, uh, and Frax are a couple of a couple of examples here. We don't consider this to be um, an all-weather approach. So while USDC studies price risk, uh, it doesn't address other risks. So like censorship, uh, regulatory, uh, counterparty risk, uh, and so on. Uh, these are these are critical risks for a stablecoin that's aiming to be non-custodial. And it's important for a stablecoin to have a vision for how to survive without USDC. That's what Gyroscope provides. We started this film talking about magic, but of course this isn't magic. It's completely explainable. It is engineering. When David Copperfield makes the Statue of Liberty disappear, the illusion is stagecraft, but the magic is in the engineering that made it possible. Now, I've lost track of the number of times I've heard that famous Arthur C. Clarke quote that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And maybe what we have here is magical, but let's not treat it as something mystical and unknowable because it's quite the opposite. The blockchain is transparent and completely knowable if you have enough time to try and get to know it. And I think the onus is on us as creators to take these new tools and do something epic with them. And that's why I come back to you, Andre Jick. Put down your playing cards, throw out your sleight of hand, and come and play here, where this thing we call magic money can really make an actual difference. It's not about money. It's about sending a message. Peeking out from behind the curtain at the greatest show in history, this was The Defiant.